Good morning to all of you. It's good to see you. It's good to be here. We actually look forward to coming to Madeira once a month, in spite of the long drive. We often ask ourselves, how long can we keep doing this? Not because of the drive, but because my parents, my mother's needing more and more care. And uh, sometimes she falls and my dad can't get her up because of his back. So we need to be there nearly all the time. Uh, this weekend we have our son come up from Reading to be with his grandpa and grandma so that we can be here. So just want you to know that um, things could change. Thank you for that offertory, Sharon and Kathy. That was beautiful. Today I want to talk about values. Values matter. My parents have been married for 75 years. And they've had a good marriage. They still do. And the reason they have a good marriage is because they chose each other because they had similar values. Debbie and I have been married, what, 46 years, 47? Something like that. 48 years ago this month, I met Debbie. And uh, it didn't take long, and we were comparing values. Now, you don't just sit down and say, what are your values? <laughs> but you begin to observe. That's what dating and courting is for, is to discover values. Because often people do not go through that process and they end up marrying each other and then discovering that their partner has totally different values than them. And those marriages often break down or they're unhappy and people stick it out. Solid, good, happy marriages are based on people with similar values. So I want to talk about values today. As Debbie and I compared our values years ago, there were values that we had in common. I want to list some values that I believe in, and you might want to suggest some that you believe in. Uh, I value God, of course, family, um, integrity. That would include things like honesty, Truthfulness. I value freedom. Now, when I dated Debbie, <clears throat> she, a lot of guys dated Debbie. And uh, that was my first interest. I thought, well, there must be something special about this girl. <laughs> and, uh, and so we met in the cafeteria because she uh, was bold enough to walk right over and stand beside me. So I jumped up and took her tray. And, you know, she was very outgoing and I was very introverted. And um, so anyway, we met. And that night I took her for a ride in my Model A Ford because after Vespers, uh, my buddy and I went over to the girls' dorm and he said, let's find someone to take for a ride in your Model A Ford, 1930 Model A Ford Coupe that I'd restored. And so we went over there and, and he had different girls being called, you know, to the lobby. None of them were in their rooms. And Debbie comes walking in. Oh, hi, Tom. She knew my friend. I didn't know Debbie, except we'd eaten breakfast together. Tom said, we're trying to find someone to go for a ride in Dennis's Model A. Oh, I'll go for a ride in his Model A. <laughs> and I've been taking her for a ride ever since. So, uh, you know, we began to date there at college, Andrews University. And uh, so Vespers, I took her to Vespers the next Friday night. And she had this long, beautiful blonde hair wore contacts back in those days. And she said, could I borrow your comb? Now I worked full time in a furniture factory spraying paint nine hours a day. And my comb was black from spray paint. I mean, it was bad. 
I said, oh, sure, no problem. Let me just slip in and comb my hair first, you know. So I went in the restroom and I'm in my fingernails and trying to get this comb clean. And finally I got it clean and came in here, no problem at all, you know. And she went in and combed her hair in the restroom. The next weekend, before the next weekend, she said, uh, I want to go home to my parents. Would you drive me? What did I have, a 1950 Dodge or 54 Chevy at the time? Something like that. So I drove her up there. What I didn't know was that she did this with every guy that showed interest in her to get evaluated by her parents. And so far, her dad had always said, he's no good for you. But she brought me and he said, well, for a guy, he's okay. So anyway, they had me stay at a friend's house. Back in those days in their family, an interesting suitor did not stay in the same house. See, they had rules, values, values. So anyway, to make a long story short, we dated and then we got engaged. And of course, I had to ask her dad before I asked her. These were old fashioned rules and values, right? That was scary enough. I lost nerve and had to come back two weeks later and try again. Her dad had this big, gruff voice. And uh, But anyway, so he said yes, and uh, things went pretty well, and, and it came down to the wedding. And her mother said, um, now you're going to need to wear a white tuxedo. I'm like, now, I, one of my values was frugality, and Debbie was very frugal. They lived in a nice home because her father built their homes, and yet um, they didn't have much money. Her parents sent her $5 a month in college for spending, and she worked her own way through. So when it came to the wedding, I wasn't going to rent a tuxedo. I mean, why waste money on something and wear it for a few hours, you know, and the ushers and the guys that stand up with you? Why do all that stuff? So I wasn't going to do that. And she said, I had to uh, rent a white tuxedo. I'm like, a white tuxedo? You're kidding me. A man in white? And so we had these arguments, me and her mother, through Debbie, see. So finally I thought, well, here's a practical solution. I will go buy a white suit because I don't want to waste money renting stuff. So I went and bought a white, a white suit. And it was a nice one. I'd never spent that much on a suit. It was high quality and everything. And so Debbie told her mother, Dennis bought a nice white suit. And she said, let me see it. So it was off white. It wasn't pure white. Now, I knew nothing about these rules, you know, that they had in Michigan. I was from South Dakota. She wrote a letter to my parents. If your son can't wear white, I want to know why now. <laughs> and my dad called me up and he said, if Debbie's anything like her mom, don't marry her. <laughs> I said, I don't think she's quite that radical. So I rented a white tuxedo. It's the only time I've given in in my life, but it was worth, see, I wanted Debbie. <laughs> I had white shoes, white socks, white underwear, white pants, white coat, white shirt, white tie, white boutonniere, and a white belt. And I felt like an absolute pansy. I was so stressed about the wedding, wedding, I don't remember anything about it, literally. I've never been able to recall the wedding. Just the other day, I said to Debbie, who was my best man? Who stood up with me? I, you know, it's all a blank. It's a bad thing. But anyway, we got married. And um, I learned something about their values. We had the same values. We interpreted them differently. <laughs> had to wear white. Well, I haven't worn white since. So, values. 
W9 value being debt free. That's part of being free. I can't spell. Freedom. Freedom is really the theme of that. Okay, I'm so glad we have informed people here. Help me through this. We value freedom so much we've always tried to stay out of debt. And we value living in the country, see. So the first place, we, we, we vowed that we would never in our married life live in town. And we were country folk. She was from the country. I was, I love the country, but didn't often live in the country, but I had good memories of when we did. We were going to live in the country. So the places we rented in college days were unbelievable. I mean, we caught shrews in our mousetrap in the kitchen and uh, you know, you could go out in the front yard and see the sewer run through a trench when you flush the toilet. I mean, these things were bad, $75 a month. And, um, but we were in the country, right? We value country living. Why? Because we value freedom. And to be free, you have to be debt free. And you don't want to be around neighbors. Where we live now, off the grid, 20 acres, we can't see any neighbors. I can be as loud as I want in my shop any hour of day or night. It doesn't matter. I can practice shooting at targets. It doesn't matter. See, freedom. And um, freedom means that I, I'm not reliant on anyone else. Independent means I fix my own cars which means I have to drive old ones so I know how. See, all that, that's all under the theme of freedom because that is a value. We value quality. Do you value quality? When I was a little kid, we still have it in a recording, Christmas. I opened this present and I was so excited. My mother used to record Christmas, it's so embarrassing. But I opened this little truck and I said, wow, how much did this cost? This looks like quality. I was already seeing quality, see. In our home, you won't find any particle board furniture. Now we don't have much money, so we go to the used stores and the antique stores and we get real wood stuff quality, value, aesthetics. Debbie's really into aesthetics. Things have to look nice. It's a good thing I married Debbie because she knows just what to do to make everything look nice on the property and in the house. Things I would never think of. In our little church, you know, she goes out there and puts decorations out. What's the occasion? Well, St. Patrick's Day is coming up. We got to have green here and there and stuff like that. Cleanliness. We value cleanliness. We both do. Do you know that in the life of a pastor visiting homes, you see the difference between people's homes? And uh, there's all different levels of cleanliness, and that's fine, but there are some things that shouldn't be. I have sat on the edge of seats in homes for fear of sliding back. You know what I'm saying? As I watched roaches walk on the walls, literally. Now I go home and take my clothes off and throw them in the washer. God expects cleanliness. I love to learn. That's a value. Good health. We share that value. Help me out here. What are some values that I'm missing here that you value? What is it? Discipline. Discipline. Okay, what else? Stability. Stability. Excellent. Work ethic, yes, 
Excellent. That was one thing I noticed about my wife, is she had a work ethic. Sometimes I think it's too much, like Debbie, relax, you know, just calm down. Always working. But that's good. Bible talks about laziness, not a good thing. What else? Honesty. Honesty. So you see, there are many values, right? And you can tell what people's values are as you observe them. If you're taking a walk down the street and you come by a nicely manicured yard with a sign, don't walk in the grass, what do you know about their values? They value a nice yard, real simple, right? You go to another place and there's no grass and there's a car jacked up in the front yard, right? What do they value? <laughs> Freedom to work on their car. Uh, you go in a house and they say, please take off your shoes. What do they value? Clean. They want everything just so. We had some friends or some people come to a seminar I held years ago. They lived in a white house with white carpet and a white grand piano and white pictures on the walls and white slippers for us to put on our feet when we entered. I mean, it was perfect. White, white, white. I didn't wear my tuxedo there, though. <clears throat> so the question is, what do you value? The Bible says, as a man or woman thinketh, so is he or she. Now, we're not perfect people. We have values that we really cherish, but we don't always... We sometimes make mistakes and don't follow those values. See? For instance, I value relationships and I value um, you know, working things out between people, but there's been some times when I lost my temper. I mean, I was angry. I let people know. <laughs> but you know what showed that the value was still there? The fact that I was bothered so much by what I did. And the fact that I had to apologize, see, showed that my value was there. So you see, values are interesting because we can value things and make mistakes and violate our values, but if it really bothers us, we have those values still. We haven't given up those values. Um, I think last month I read a couple laws out of the laws of Hammurabi ancient laws coming from the 18th century BC and let me just read two laws here and ask you what the values are where did those wrinkled pages go ah, here we are if a signor signor I don't know that sounds like Spanish to me but this is the Middle East, came forward with a false testimony in a case and has not proved the word which he spoke. In that case, if it was involving life and death, that person shall be put to death. What did they value? Honesty, truthfulness. And they did not tolerate lying, especially in a court situation. Now let me read this one. It's quite relevant to today if a woman has had a miscarriage by her own act what do we call that abortion and here we're talking about 1750 years before christ if a woman has had a miscarriage by her own act when they have prosecuted her and convicted her they shall impale her on stakes without bearing her what did they value human life and they knew and this was shortly after the flood God had said if anyone takes another man's life another person's life they must give their own life at the hand of man and those laws coming out of the ark no no I no ache laws they're called there's actually seven of them 
that uh, the Jews considered applied to all Gentiles. Thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not commit adultery, and there were four others. The last one being, thou shalt set up courts and judges to make people comply to the first laws, <laughs> to give them teeth. And so you see how laws actually reflect values of societies, which is interesting as I began to think about this. You know, the Bible is a book of origins, starting with Genesis and Exodus. It begins with telling us where we came from and telling us what God's values are and what he requires of us. The Bible is an amazing book. And uh, as you look at the Ten Commandments, let's think about those for a moment. They reflect God's values. So what I was wanting to do as I was thinking through all this and preparing this sermon, I want us to replace, you see in our society, law and rule and commandment, those are all negative. Obey, that's a four letter word. People don't want to hear about, res about obedience. They resist and recoil at that, which is sad because God's laws are what bring happiness to our lives. But let's just replace law with value. You know, there's a, a well-known quotation from Ellen White that says that uh, the Ten Commandments or God's law are a reflection of his character. And I always scratch my head and said, now how does that work? How do laws reflect someone's character? I finally got it as I was preparing this talk. And that is they tell us what heaven's values are, what God's values are. So when we look at the, the law, thou shalt not murder, what does God value? Life. When we look at thou shalt not bear false witness, God values honesty. Honor thy father and thy mother. What does God value? Family relationships, right? Uh, thou shalt not commit adultery. What does God value? The marriage. Um, remember the Sabbath. What does God value? He values time with us his creation, see. So when you look at God's laws as merely his values that he wants to instill in us so that we share values with God, it takes on a different meaning. I wanna show a clip here, which I think is quite fascinating. Uh, Jordan Peterson, in the middle of a longer talk, um, Jordan Peterson is a famous well-known atheist and author who has recently converted to Christianity. This is amazing. The Joe Rogan experience. If categories dis 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 dissolve, especially fundamental ones, the culture is dissolving because the culture is a structure of category. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Right. So, and in fact, culture is a culture is a structure of category that we all share. So we see th things the same way. Well, that's why we can talk. I mean, not exactly the same way, because then we'd have nothing to talk about. But roughly speaking, we have a bedrock of agreement. Uh, that's the Bible, by the way. So I just walked through the Museum of the Bible in Washington. That was very cool. It's a very cool museum. So the structure, that's what the Bible Yeah, that's what provides. I figured out. I mean, I just figured this out this week. So it was a cool, it was a cool thing to walk through, because it's, it's chronological. They have one floor, which is the history of the Bible. Mm. But it's not exactly that. It's really what it is, is the history of the book. Now, in many ways, the first book was the Bible. I mean, literally, because at one point there was only one book, like as far as our Western culture is concerned, there was one book. And for a while, literally, there was only one book. And that book was the Bible. And then before it was the Bible, it was, a, you know, it was scrolls and it was writings on papyrus, and, but it was, we were starting to aggregate written text together, and it went through all sorts of technological transformations, and then it became books that everybody could buy, the book everybody could buy, and the first one of those was the Bible, and then it became all sorts of books that everybody could buy. But all those books, in some sense, emerged out of that underlying book, and that book itself, the Bible isn't a book, it's a library, it's a collection of books. And so, what I figured out was partly because I was talking to my brother-in-law, Jim Keller, who's the world's greatest chip 
designer and has now designed a chip that's as powerful as the human brain, which is optimized for artificial intelligence learning, by the way. And so I talked to him about that. He said, you heard of the internet? I said, yeah, Jim, I've heard of the internet. He said, this is way more revolutionary than that. So in any case, we were talking about meaning in text because we were talking about translation and the problem of understanding text. And Jim said, the meaning of words is coded in the relationship of the words to one another. And the postmodernists make that case that all meaning is derived from the relationship between words. That's wrong because, well, what about rage? That's not words. And what about moving your hand? That's not words. So it's wrong, but, but part of it's right because the meaning we derive from the verbal domain is encoded in the relationship between words. So, so now then you think, well, let's think about the relationship between words. Well, some words are dependent on other words. Some ideas are dependent on other ideas. The more ideas are dependent on a given idea, the more fundamental that idea is. By de that's a definition of fundamental. So now imagine you have an aggregation of texts in a civilization. You say, which are the fundamental texts? And the answer is, the texts upon which most other texts depend. And so you put Shakespeare way in there in English because so many texts are dependent on Shakespeare's literary revelations. And Milton would be in that category, and Dante would be in that category, at least in translation. Fundamental authors, part of the Western canon, not because of the arbitrary dictates of power, but because those texts influenced more other texts. And then you think about that as a hierarchy, okay, with the Bible at its base, which is certainly the case. Now imagine that's the entire corpus of, li of linguistic production, all things considered. Now how do you understand that? Like, literally, how do you understand that? The answer is, you sample it by reading and listening to stories and listening to people talk. You sample that whole domain. You build a low-resolution representation of that in your, inside you. And then you listen and see through that. And so it isn't that the Bible is true. It's that the Bible is the precondition for the manifestation of truth, which makes it way more true than just true. It's a whole different kind of true. And I think this is, I think this is not only literally the case, factually, I think it can't be any other way. It's the only way we can solve the problem of perception. Pretty amazing, isn't it, that a former atheist would come to the conclusion the Bible is not only true, it's the essence and the origin of truth. And so we find the Bible, which is, you know, uh, in the Dark Ages, the Bible wasn't available. And so today we find that the Bible is readily available, but the devil makes sure that we have so many other distractions, we don't read the Bible. We, as I've mentioned before, we are in a second dark ages in our culture. Meaning that most people's values do not derive from the Bible. And that's why our society is so messed up. We are in a cultural war today. America was founded on biblical principles, but has drifted so far in 250 years that many don't even know that there were such a thing as biblical principles. And people are caught up in their entertainment and exciting lives, which aren't always so exciting, and suicides are on the rise. Because the center, the heart, the Bible, truth, God's values. As I was thinking about this, I thought about salvation. There are many shallow ideas of salvation. I've mentioned this before. Only believe and you'll be saved. And so people grasp onto a few verses like that in the Bible. And they, well, that's all I have to do is just believe. But it's interesting the context for those things. Um, they were often said to people who already had values in place. What you lack is one thing, Jesus told the rich young ruler. Believe, follow. But values are the essence. 
in this great controversy between Christ and Satan. The God is allowed to happen and we are a laboratory which is almost finished to demonstrate whose values actually work. We are lining up on one side or the other. We might say, well, I accepted Christ, I believe, but if our values aren't in tune with heaven, we won't be there. I had a friend who's, who's a pastor and his father was a pastor and his father was very elderly. His father, um, his first wife died and he had another wife and they had so many children. I don't remember what number my friend was, but his father, I actually met him, but he died in his 90s some years ago. And as a little boy, he was at camp meeting, he heard Ellen White speak. So we're talking about a man who's lived a long time. But he said, he's come to the conclusion in his ministry that if you would be happy in heaven, you will be there. <laughs> what does that mean? that our values are in line with Jesus' values. Heaven is looking for every excuse to save everyone. Did you know the Bible says in Romans, I think it's the fifth chapter, that by one man sin entered the world and by one man righteousness came to all? Does that mean all will be saved? No. But Jesus on the cross made provision for every sin of every person. Is every person going to be saved? No. Most would not be happy in heaven. But if your values are in line with God's values, if you are in love with Jesus because Jesus' values are your values, then laws and obedience mean nothing because naturally you want to please the Lord because that pleases you. It's like marriage. When two people share values and say, wow, we're alike in so many ways. Debbie and I both grew up in Adventist Christian homes. Neither one of us had TV in the home. We were totally naive about all the programs that are on TV. We both ate the same kind of diet. There was no learning curve we had to have after we were married. And the Bible challenges us because it lays out God is our creator. This is your origin. You are of value. Jesus died for you. Here are heavenly values. If you want to be saved, they need to be your values too. And the Holy Spirit is given to make them our values if we're willing. So what I'm challenging you today is to not look at laws and obedience as something negative, but look at them as God's values. And we want to share values with him. You know, this great controversy, God set in motion Abraham and his descendants, and he gave the prophets and truth and writings and the Bible so that we would have all these truths and values. And of course, the devil countered what God did, and he uh, chose someone who was totally given over to him. You've heard me talk about this in seminars. Nimrod was his name. And by the way, in history, his name was probably Sargon. Nimrod meant rebel, probably wasn't given at birth. How many would name their newborn baby? Oh, he looks like a rebel. Let's name him rebel. <laughs> But uh, Nimrod's name was, or was called Rebel. Probably in history, he was known as Sargon the Great. Sargon the Great was the first empire builder. And he expanded his empire in the Mesopotamian area. And the cities that he expanded it to include are the same list as what we find Nimrod ruling over in the book of Genesis chapter 10. Very interesting stuff. Well, Sargon had a daughter. Her name was Enheduanna. Not sure how to pronounce it. She was, he made her the priestess of the moon god Nana. Now, I don't know if this was really her his daughter. As you go back in history, things get kind of muddy. 
My guess is that this is probably Semiramis, who was actually his wife, but nevertheless, uh, the moon god uh, Nana, the temple to Nana was in Ur of the Chaldees. Who do we know came out of Ur? Abraham. Abraham. Okay. And of course, uh, this was prior to Abraham's time, actually. And uh, do you know that, you know, in this clip that we just saw, he talked about the, va the Bible being the oldest book. And it's true, you can't find books older than the Bible, but we can find fragments of things. We can find burial tablets. We can find songs and poetry. The oldest songs and poetry were written by Enheduanna, Sargon's daughter, or Nimrod's. And from those poems, which are based on themes of everyday life, including love and things like that, it's interesting that we discover the values of people within two or three hundred years after the flood and how they drift so rapidly. In these songs, we discover some of their values. In one of the songs or poems, she talks about the practice of men dressing like women and women dressing like men and being unhappy with who they are and wanting to be something different. Have you ever heard of that before? This is a very ancient thing. Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. The Bible is the basis for heaven's values. It's the book we need to immerse ourselves in. We need to make these our values. We are in a cultural civil war, but we need to people, be people who retain heaven's values. As I've mentioned before, there's a second Babylon has fallen in the Bible, Revelation 18. There's a call to come out of her, my people. For there to be a Babylon, there has to be a dark ages. We are living in the most enlightened time in history when it comes to knowledge, but we are in the dark ages when it comes to value. We are in the second dark ages. How do I know that? Because the Bible says, come out of her Babylon confusion, which was the dark ages years ago, but there's another one now. He says, come out of her, my people. How do you come out by adopting heaven's values? Revelation 18 verse one says, I saw a mighty angel from heaven. The earth was illumined with its glory. What was it that ended the dark ages years ago? Printing press, enlightenment, Bible. What is it that will bring us out of these dark ages just before Jesus comes? It's exactly what's going in our, on in our world today. People like Jordan Peterson, an atheist, saying what he did that you heard today. This is happening. Our society is being polarized between righteousness and evil. We are often appalled at how can society get so bad? I never dreamed we would be in this place. Do you know, on the other hand, righteousness is increasing? God's people are, are living closer to the values of heaven. There is a polarization. And before Jesus comes, God's people will be sealed and the devils will be marked. Neither side will be movable. Sealed by the Holy Spirit, nothing the devil can throw at God's people will change them because they have permanently adopted heaven's values. On the other hand, the mark it's actually called the engraving on stone. The mark of the beast means that there will be people unchangeable. Nothing can move them. You wonder why people can be so far out today and, uh, and, and miss logical truth so far. Well, nothing will change those people. I've discovered in doing seminars that the closer we get, to the end of time, the more difficult it is to find people who are willing to change their thinking because the polarization that's going on in society. Revelation 12, 17 in closing. Revelation 12, 17. 
referring to the final battle on planet Earth, which is expanded on in Revelation 13. This text actually introduces Revelation 13. It says, the dragon, that's the devil, was enraged with the woman. He went off to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God. In other words, this problem started in heaven many years ago because the devil said, I have, or Lucifer at that time said, my values are better. Put me on the throne. The universe will be happier. God said, no, your values don't work. Well, we're going to try it out and see who's right. Now we're toward the end of that experiment. And the devil, there's nothing new about it because he's angry with those who continue with heaven's values. It says he went off to make war with those who keep the commandments of God, those who retain the values of heaven. So my question in closing, do you retain the values of heaven? If you do, you will enjoy heaven and you'll be there. Because Jesus died to make it possible for everybody that loves righteousness to be there. Don't look at your life and say, well, I keep blowing it. I keep making mistakes. I keep falling. I wonder if I've remembered to confess every sin. That's not the way salvation works. Here's the way salvation works. If we have adopted heaven's values, it's not the deed or misdeed, but it's the trend of the life, which is based on heaven's values. If you've made mistakes and say, I hate myself for that. I wish I'd never done that. That's because you still have heavenly values. If you don't feel bad about sin, if I don't feel bad about sin, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I'm in trouble. May God help us. And let's uh, sing in closing.